Chris commanded troops uh, on the ground in Afghanistan. He got the feel of the country and its factions, and there are many factions, uh, and he convinced Taliban, uh, well, I should say Taliban sympathizers uh, from Hezbi is Islami, uh, by the hundreds to cross over uh, and start working with the government uh, instead of trying to topple the government. He was based at the time in Nuristan and Kunar provinces. Uh, I think he came, came away, as he's told me, and, and he's written this, uh, convinced that the faction you have to win over uh, in war of this kind is the population of the country. And it's not just a faction, it's the population. Um, but the American goal in Afghanistan was summed up in the title of his book. Um, zero Sum Victory. Um, and, uh, and it's a book that comes out of his PhD uh, thesis, by the way. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the theme is uh, bomb the enemy, don't negotiate with them. We win, you lose. That's what zero sum victory means. <clears throat> Chris is not only a man of arms, but also a former advisor to successive secretaries of defense. Um, uh, he had also negotiated with uh, Hezbi Salama uh, itself, but he also negotiated with the Taliban uh, uh, at the highest level. Uh, so this is like a diplomatic uh, function uh, as well. Um, he's a graduate of West Point who taught at West Point. He got his PhD at King's College in uh, London, and <clears throat> distilling his experiences on the ground. Uh, and this book uh, emerged from his PhD. Uh, but he's now a critic on the outside, and tonight we'll share the lessons he's learned. Uh, he just told me something fascinating and, and, and dismaying, uh, which is that uh, in the U.S. government, uh, which uh, only a year and a half ago pulled out of Afghanistan after 20 years, uh, there is no actual um, inquest into what went wrong in those 20 years and why, why this forever war ended in, in such ignominy. Um, anyway, without further ado, Chris. Um, how many remember the withdrawal, the chaotic pull out of Afghanistan? Okay. Uh, what were some of the emotions as you think back on that time? Uh, you're thinking about all of the Afghans flooding the gates, uh, the suicide bomber that killed 13 Americans, uh, people trying to hold on to the wheel wells of the C-17s as they're taken out from the airport. And, and then Taliban flags flying over the presidential palace, Taliban driving our Humvees, flying our helicopters that we left behind. What are some of the emotions that ran through your mind as you're seeing this and remembering all that? Okay, surprise, yeah. Um, anger, shame, okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Sure, like here we go again. Yep. What else? Total dismay? Guilt? Guilt? All right. Yeah, frustration. What a waste. I mean, I, I felt all of that as somebody. I, I think I spent four and a half, from 2007 to 2014, about four or so years of within those seven were on the ground in Afghanistan, both as a Commander in combat, 15 months, 800 paratroopers in eastern Afghanistan. Roy talked a little bit about that. If you read Jake Tapper's best-selling book, The Outpost, uh, my unit is the middle section in there. Um, and then spent time as a senior advisor to Generals McChrystal, Petraeus, and, and Dunford. When I looked at it, I, I mean, I was very angry. 2,325 American service members were killed in that war alone. Tens of thousands wounded. Six of my own paratroopers were killed in action and dozens wounded. We spent three trillion US taxpayer dollars, spent over 20 years there building a house of cards that toppled at the first sign of resistance. I was angry. I was disgusted that when push came to shove, Afghan senior leaders from the very top all the way on down just seemed to take the money and run. 
and then disappointed. Disappointed that, that we got to this point where our choice was to just keep a forever war going forever with no strategic goal in mind or to leave and knowing that the whole thing was just gonna come apart. Didn't, maybe we didn't expect it to come apart that soon, but figured it was probably coming apart. How did we get to that point? And disappointed that, when you look at Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Yemen, I mean, our track record is not awesome. You know, one military disaster is a tragedy. Two military disasters is an awful coincidence. Three military disasters suggest a pattern of disturbing behavior that we need to fix. And yet there is no effort whatsoever to examine what's consistently going wrong about these wars. Why is it that the world's most powerful country, the world's most powerful military, goes into these military interventions, they repeatedly end in disaster? Why is nobody asking this question? And so I wrote this book, Zero Sum Victory, looking at why, what, what are the things that we're doing at the policy and strategy level that are resulting in these interventions consistently turning into disaster? Um, and the book uh, won a gold medal, uh, the best book in 2021 in the war military category. So I was, I was pretty psyched about that. Well, let's talk about Afghanistan. So I'll talk about three reasons, proximate causes for failure, and then uh, a little bit more on the more systemic issues that are creating these, these quagmires. So the, the first problem in Afghanistan, first reason for disaster, this whole thing coming down like a house of toothpicks, is that the Afghan government never bothered to gain the buy-in of its people. Instead, the Afghan government turned itself into a predatory kleptocracy that spent more time stealing from the people and stealing from each of you than it did trying to govern. If you were a, wanted to be a governor or a police chief in what they called a tier one province, that was one of the bigger provinces. Uh, you paid a couple million US dollars for that job. Afghan government positions were for sale. And this is not, these were not donations into the public coffers out of a spirit of the common good. This is a down payment, rent on your position with the expectation that you're gonna use the position to make the money back and turn a profit. So if you want to be a police chief, a governor, you may spend a couple million. If you want to be a general, you may, may be in, in the army a few hundred thousand. And then you're able to use your position to engage in the black market trade, gems, timber, opium. A senior official in the Afghan government, Ministry of Interior, told me that there was actually at one point, a queue to be the governor of, or the police chief of Helmand, six months at a time, and you pay a couple million dollars for the job, and, and you get so much money from the open trade that you're set for life. And so people just lined up. Um, engaging in land theft, kidnapping for ransom, and one of my personal favorites using your position to manipulate intelligence so that US military would go after your personal and political rivals. All we'd say is, where's, where's Roy? There's Roy, Roy's Taliban, Roy's Taliban. And he's fomenting, uh, you know, he's gonna have a pep rally at his house and attack your outpost. And then I just get a couple more people to give the same report and suddenly, this is actionable intelligence. And we start looking at Roy. And because of confirmation bias, we start to think, oh, Roy's actually up to no good. Look at what he's doing. Look at how he's saying, look at them. Look at how he's, he's writing notes in this book. That must mean he's up to no good. Um, and then we start to target him. And all of this behavior 
is pushing people into the arms of the Taliban. So in 2002, I may need somebody to hold this board. Do we have one of the interns here? Maybe not. That's, that's all right. I'll just be very careful. In 2002, um, most people supported the Afghan government. There was a lot of enthusiasm. The Taliban were like the most unpopular and the most deplorable government on the planet. The Afghan government, all they had to do was just be a little bit better. Just a little bit better. You had a population of undecided, probably looked about like that, and then a few people still supporting the Taliban. That's 2002. Because of some of this behavior that I mentioned, by 2010, the situation looked like this. Some people supporting the government, most people undecided, and a few people supporting the Taliban. But the predatory corruption continued. And more and more Afghans got pushed to the side of the Taliban to the point at which in 2021, Afghans overwhelmingly voted with their feet to say that the Taliban were the lesser of two evils between, yeah, uh, Taliban were, were the lesser of two evils. So this is what things look like by 2021. With a lot of people supporting, oops, that should be a T. A lot of people supporting the Taliban, number of undecided, very few people supporting the Afghan government. And then, of course, the senior leaders took the money and ran. So the Afghan government never bothered to gain the buy-in from its people. Um, and as a result, uh, people just simply voted with their feet. The second proximate reason is um, dependency. The Afghan government, excuse me, the second reason is complacency. Complacency is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. So you were thinking I was going to say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. This is true. But complacency, a little bit different. You do the same thing over and over again, and you expect the same results. Because when your adversary is innovating and you are not, then at some point the tables are going to turn. So when you look at um, <clears throat> innovation, and time. So this would be innovation, and this would be time. Uh, for the US and Afghan government, we pretty much kept doing business as usual. From 2002, when things settled down a little bit, to 2021, it was, it was old chai in a new cup. It was basically the same theme over and over again. For the Afghan government, it was just getting more and more aggressive with the corruption. And for us, it was a combination of night raids, put pressure on Pakistan, and um, that the Taliban would simply give up. The Taliban, meanwhile, are innovating. So they start here in 2000. In 2001, the Taliban offered to surrender. And we said, no. Got to be captured or killed. You and Al-Qaeda are one and the same. They offered again in 2003 and 4. Again, we and the Afghan government said no. In 2010, 11, 12, 13, in the negotiations I was involved in, the Taliban were reaching out saying, we want to start talks, uh, and we could just never get our act together. And that's when we had 140,000 140, international troops on the ground. The Afghan government is building up to 350,000 troops. And the Afghan government and members of the US government resisted talks saying that, well, we need to negotiate from a position of strength. Knowing full well that the president already committed to a drawdown. And so by 2021, we're left negotiating an agreement with the Taliban that traded no troops 
for Taliban promises of no terrorism. And then pretty soon the whole thing collapsed. So from the Taliban standpoint, so we're, we're doing business as usual, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same results. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's all going to work out. The Taliban are innovative. They're innovating militarily, um, you know, from mass attacks to IEDs to infiltrations. They're innovating politically, uh, establishing their, their code of conduct, enforcing that code of conduct on their, uh, on their commanders to start treating the Afghan population more humanely. Uh, accountability for civilian casualties, which the Afghan government never had. And, and internationally, diplomatically, they're innovating, getting into talks with us, getting into talks with other, um, other countries, essentially to say, hey, we're, 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 not, we're not our uncle's Taliban. We're different. And so for the Taliban, this is what innovation looks like. And pretty soon by 2021, the Taliban have turned the tables. We got complacent, they didn't. You know, Sears was like the most innovative company for a really long time. I mean, sending telephone or catalogs on trains, you know, people would fill out the stuff and send it back and, and their furniture would appear, it was awesome. It made Sears this huge conglomerate, this huge company. And then they got complacent. There's no reason Sears couldn't be Amazon. There's no reason that Blockbuster couldn't be Netflix. And yet they got complacent. There's no reason why the Afghan government had to collapse like a house of cards. And yet they got complacent. And then finally, I'm gonna, the third reason just going to use this same chart, a very similar chart anyway, um, is, uh, is dependency. We weren't very good partners. You know, I'm a, I'm a consultant. I consult for other businesses. And my job as a consultant is to make sure that when me and the client part ways, that the client is able to soar to new heights on their own. It's unethical for me as a consultant to create dependency. It's unethical for the United States government to create dependency, such dependency on a foreign government, that when we start to lift off, instead of soaring to new heights, they crash and burn. It's exactly what we did. Um, so part of this is as uh, the Afghan government corruption, here's the corruption curve, rises, they are burning legitimacy and readiness faster than we can build it. So here's the readiness curve. I remember one time we were, I was with one of the generals and it was this commander's conference and one of the people training the Afghan army stood up and said, sir, we need to get more contractors in to repair the Afghan vehicles. Because what's happening is all their heavy vehicles, their MRAPs and stuff like that, these behemoth vehicles that are mine resistant are not working. And so the commanders are having to send their soldiers out in Ford Rangers, these pickup trucks, and they get blown up by AEDs. And the reason why I said they don't know how to maintain the vehicles. I pulled the general aside and I said, General, I got a different explanation for you. He said, what's that? And I said, the reason why those vehicles are broken and they're not being reported is because that's exactly how the commander wants it. He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, sir, the MRAPs are gas guzzlers. They take a lot of fuel. And so do the up-armored Humvees. They take a lot of fuel. The Ford Ranger is very fuel efficient. So what the commanders are doing are they're getting all of the gasoline and all of the repair parts and everything for these vehicles and selling it on the black market and putting their soldiers out in Ford Rangers to get blown up. And it turns out it's exactly what was going on. So corruption's increasing, readiness is decreasing, and the dependency curve is going to basically follow the corruption curve. 
they became so dependent that once we, once we lifted off, they just simply collapsed. This is, this is strategic malpractice. This is not, this is not okay. And when we look at these Vietnam, 58,000 killed, seven plus year war, Iraq, uh, we lost 4,000, over 4,000 soldiers in Iraq, $4 trillion. Afghanistan, 20 years, $3 trillion, 2,300 uh, plus service members killed. I mean, this pattern of behavior is not okay. And nobody's talking about it. You don't hear anybody on either political party talking about national security reform, talking about why our interventions continue to turn into disasters. So part of the reason why they turn into disasters are things that we are doing to ourselves. And that's what I look at at zero sum victory. You know, if you've got three very different conflicts, but you have common errors in each of those conflicts, it, it suggests that there is a pattern that demands our attention. So overall, you know, the seeds of these disasters are happen somewhat like this. We begin a war. So this is start. Um, and as we begin a war, or we think about getting into the war, we, we, have a, we have an idea of what success looks like. Thank you, sir. We have a general idea of what failure looks like. So in Afghanistan, success looked like an Afghan government that was at peace with itself and its neighbors, no longer a home to international terrorist groups, and obeying the or following the basic international conventions on human rights. That success in Afghanistan never really changed those core, those core elements, never really changed. Failure is about the opposite of that. Um, and, but then between the start point where we are now and success and failure is what Clausewitz might call the fog of war. Seriously. Um, and, and so what do good planners do when they're dealing with fog and uncertainty and everything? You start from the objective and you reverse engineer it back to the start point. So that's where, exactly what our planners do. President says, military, give me options. Military says, yes, Mr. President. And the president selects one of these options and this is a problem in and of itself. Turning to the military first for options is what's getting into this in the first place. The military is only going to create military options. That's what they do. That's what we do. That's our jam, military options. So the military planners are going to say, OK, selected military option A. So we're going to reverse engineer from the success figure out what the critical points are and make them into milestones. These are milestones. We love our milestones. Uh, write a constitution, have a presidential election, build an army, build a police force, build an economy. Those are examples of milestones. And then we have my green pen. And then we have this military intervention that seeks to put us on that path towards zero-sum decisive victory. This is zero-sum decisive victory. There are three ways wars can end. Decisive victory, negotiated outcome, and theoretically you can transition to the host. To the host nation government. So theoretically, you can transition to the host nation government. I don't know if it's ever been done successfully, but in theory, it can work. But this is a zero-sum decisive victory trajectory. But once we intervene, two critical factors emerge and are decisive. The first one, and this is for insurgency. The first question is, is the insurgency sustainable? That means, does the insurgency have tangible international and national support? Do they have international sanctuary? 
Do they have international sanctuary? Um, and do they have enough indigenous support to field a team? So this is, um, actually, let me use green. This is insurgent sustainable. Yes, no. The second factor, let me back up. An insurgency that has had sustainable support has been successful every single time since at least the Second World War, probably before that, every single time. By contrast, a host nation government that is unable to win the battle of legitimacy in insurgent controlled and contested areas has been unsuccessful every single time since at least the Second World War, if not beyond that. So is the host nation government legit? Host nation government legit or not legit? Okay, so the only way that you get a zero-sum decisive victory is if the insurgency is not sustainable and the host nation government is legitimate. That's it. That's the only one of the four scenarios where you have the possibility of a zero-sum victory. In Afghanistan, in Vietnam, in Iraq, we had insurgencies with sanctuary and host nation governments unable to win the battle of legitimacy in insurgent controlled and contested areas. It's like burning the candle at both ends with a blowtorch. No way you're gonna get zero sum decisive victory. So a lot of factors go into whether the insurgency is sustainable, host nation governments legitimate. Those include um, local actors, uh, those include government officials, those include international actors and officials, uh, um, opposition leaders, et cetera. And if those, if these turn south, so if you're in one of these other three boxes, your trajectory starts to go this way. Starts to head towards failure. And then that trajectory gets sticky. We have a hard time getting off of that trajectory because of things like cognitive bias. Where you believe, because you're hitting the milestones, that you're on this track. But the problem is every single one of these milestones gets compromised. Elections get rigged. Uh, the Afghan army out of the first 100 generals, 97 of them were from a single province. So all of these milestones get corrupted. Um, you're really down in this, you're, you're, you're in this trajectory here, but we believe that we're still up here. So you get confirmation bias, all the reporting. Um, you know, any report that suggests we're up here gets more weight. Any report that suggests we're down here gets discounted. Uh, there, uh, it's just dead enders. It's going to be a cakewalk. Um, you know, look at how horrible this group, that group, and the other group is, and how wonderful our government partners are. The second one is organizational silos. We we have nobody in charge of our wars. I'll draw it up. We have nobody in charge of our wars. You have the President of the United States. Below the President, you have members of the National Security Council, state, DOD, um, and then you've got uh, other elements like USAID and the intelligence communities. They then deploy capabilities into a place like Afghanistan. So state's got the ambassador. DOD has got the four-star general. And oftentimes you have mini silos. Four-star general, special operations forces. The Marines once um, in Afghanistan reported directly to CENTCOM. They didn't report to the uh, four-star general in, uh, in Afghanistan. Really bizarre. Um, age, you got your development folks on the ground. And within the intelligence community, of course, you got all of your three-letter agencies, 
Um, and they're all reporting up to their masters in Washington, D.C. So if this is what's on the ground in Afghanistan, you tell me who's in charge. There is nobody in charge. There is no one person that the President of the United States can point to and say, you are responsible and accountable for success. And I'm giving you authority over all deployed elements of US national power to bring about a favorable and durable outcome. Nobody the president can point to. And so you get this situation where the ambassador reports to Congress that we're making great progress. We have, we have excuse me, we have trained so many Afghan, Iraqi, Vietnamese officials, et cetera. The general says, Mr. President, we're making great progress. We have killed so many Taliban. We have trained so many security forces, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. The development people say, Mr. President, we're making great progress. We have uh, built all of these roads and schools and electrical plants. And the intelligence community says, Mr. President, we're making great progress. I could tell you about more about it, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so you know you've got a silo problem when everybody says they're making great progress but things are spiraling downhill. And so everybody is doing their own thing, staying in their own lane. That's how the US government is organized bureaucratically. Um, and we're making great progress while things are, are going downhill. And of course, everybody sees this, except for the people in the US government because of this. And then finally, you get host nation entrapment with the uh, sectarianism, in Iraq, the uh, predatory corruption in Afghanistan, the corruption in, in Vietnam. Um, and the host nation government is always the one that goes kicking and screaming the most, won't want any negotiations, wants to keep the gravy train going because of the, the effect, you know, as corruption goes up, readiness goes down, and therefore dependency goes up. Um, that's, this, this is the entrapment effect. And so as these things become hypnotic habits, we are moving out towards failure, and this reality gap continues to grow. Until at some point, the president says, we're done with this, no more, we're withdrawing, and um, let's see if we can negotiate our way out of this, or let's see if we can transition it over. And once, once we say, we're out of here, we've lost all our leverage. Yeah, because the insurgency knows that they're all they got to do is play for time because they're going to be much stronger after we leave than while we're still there. And so we get stuck. We either get stuck there or we pull out and, and disaster happens. So what do we do about it? Well, I think there are three things that we can, three low cost, high payoff ways that we can begin to address these problems. The first one is we have got to put somebody in charge. Somebody has got to be accountable. And it can't be the president you, you, alone. <laughs> you know, it would be like if you're the, the CEO of Ford Motor Company and you didn't have plant managers at all your plants across the world. You just had like the director of logistics reporting directly to Detroit, the director of operations at each plant reporting directly to Detroit. And the only one who can make decisions, who can make people play nicely together, is the CEO. You can't run a business like that. You can't run foreign policy like that. This is madness. And this is why the, the White House has to micromanage everything is because they, they have to get all of these cats and dogs to play together nicely. And you just can't do it from Washington, D.C. So you've got to find somebody who is you need. The president needs to it needs to look like this. You've got the NSC who still advise the president. Um, and uh, you have a uh, General McChrystal called it a high commissioner. He actually recommended this at one point. A high commissioner um, in a place like Afghanistan, in a deployed area of operations. And all of the deployed elements of power work for that person. And that person has the authority to tell him what to do. Um, and 
uh, has the accountability to deliver uh, the president's policy aims. The second way is we need a national security doctrine. We have no shared language among the national security agencies in the United States. The military's got awesome doctrine, volumes of it fill this entire room, but the US government doesn't have any doctrine. There's no shared language, terms, and concepts. So you see, you get people talking past one another all the time. Um, the word defeat meant different things to different people in Afghanistan. The word reconciliation meant different things to different people. And when you have people using the same terms in different ways, then you have a recipe for a lot of confusion and poor coordination. The third thing that we need to do is develop an expert body of knowledge on war termination. We uh, have a lot of expert knowledge on how to start wars. We have a lot of expert knowledge of how to fight wars. We have no expert knowledge of how to wage wars. Wars are fought by military, they're waged by governments. So you need a body, you need, you need that doctrine so people are using the same words to mean the same things. And then you need a body of expert knowledge on war termination. How you either gain a decisive victory, how you use elements of national power to gain a negotiated outcome that meets your interests, or to transition and deal with the host nation entrapment. We don't have that, and so we just sort of go stumbling through and, um, and you look at our war termination episodes that other than World War II, um, they've, been, they've been very problematic. So we need to create an expert body of knowledge for the US government on how to wage war and how to work together towards war termination. Three very high payoff, very low cost um, ways to at least begin to address this problem. This problem. I will be delighted to take your questions. And um, obviously, the, everybody was hurting in the United States. Everybody was uh, suffering from the, uh, the huge losses from 9-11. <clears throat> and uh, there was a mood of uh, revenge. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of our very top officials talked about, a mood of, uh, talked about revenge, you know, you know, killing the varmints and, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and they weren't talking about uh, another out, a different outcome, a long-term outcome, a desired outcome. A political outcome. So, uh, where does this? Uh, and, and, and instead, we began the counterterrorism operations, which uh, basically consisted of bombing from high altitudes um, and sometimes lower altitudes and killing people, but um, not actually constructing a, <clears throat> a government and sustaining a government and making sure that that government stayed un un uncorrupted. Uh, so, the question is, where does uh, where does this doc this part of the doctrine come from? If it's a doctrine. <clears throat> of uh, uh, of not having a political goal, uh, but using um, uh, all your means possible uh, to kill uh, the other side. Um, thanks, thanks, Roy. the The war termination discussion needs to happen at the very start of the strategy making and policy making. So we tend to talk about war strategy in terms of ends, ways, and means, and it's flawed. Uh, because we tend to talk um, political ends and primarily military-centric ways. Because when we go to war, the first person that the president turns to is DOD. I want military options. DOD creates invariably three military options. The president picks one, and then the rest of the agencies say, this is how we're going to support it. That's shorthand for how, how it works. Um, DOD is not competent to talk about wartime negotiations or transitions. It's not, what, it's not what DOD does. And so what should happen instead is the president should turn to the national security advisor and say, I want three options. And those options could be by war termination outcome. I want an option for decisive victory. I want an option for a negotiated outcome that meets our interests. I want an option for a transition, something like that. And then, um, and then the national security advisor would then get interagency teams together to develop those, those kinds of options. Um, that's what ought to happen. That will prevent us from having these 
military centric approaches to political problems that won't possibly work. How is it with a general like Petraeus with a PhD who fully understands war ends negotiations, a four star admiral who is the commander in chief of UCOM, also with a PhD, very knowledgeable about strategy and war termination. Jim Mattis, a four star general and a later the Secretary of Defense, arguably one of the brightest guys who ever put on a uniform, a Secretary of Defense with a PhD in physics, a National Security Advisor who during the uh, O'Biden administration did exactly what you asked for. O'Biden asked the National Security Advisor to bring him a plan to fit or to get out of Afghanistan. Mm. And there was a heated debate in which the current president of the United States was involved. He offered one solution, which was not chosen. But the, the question to you is this. How is it with all of that brain power, all of that intellectual capability that has been present? And I didn't mention the special operations commanders who have been the brightest of the brightest over there. How is it with all that brain power that we screwed it up so much? Um, it's these three factors. <clears throat> it's these three factors, primarily. Um, it's a lot of confirmation bias. I mean, there is a there is a, a prevailing belief within much of the Department of Defense and Department of State, by the way, that yes, the war was going to end in a negotiated outcome, but it would be a negotiated outcome between the Afghan government and and a Taliban that was on the verge of a, of surrender. So they were essentially negotiating their surrender. Um, and so if we just kept at it long enough and we pressured the Pakistanis to pressure the Taliban and we kept building up the Afghan government, that eventually the Taliban would just simply give up. That was, I mean, that, that's what people believed. Very smart people believed. Um, the, the other one is, is, is the silos. What the generals are doing is they've got a mission, you know, and, and they, they've got very clear um, marching orders from the president, build the Afghan National Security Forces, degrade the Taliban, um, that's, and that's what they did. Negotiate outcome, that is, that is so far outside their lane, and DOD is, tends to be very sensitive about encroaching in other people's turf, that, I mean, it is very much this is our lane, and this is what we're going to report on. Uh, you look at some congressional testimonies of chairman of the Joint Chiefs and secretaries of defense when they're sort of asked some of these questions about, well, do you think that the Afghan government's going to win a decisive victory in so many words? And, and so they have to couch it in terms of risk. Well, corruption's a big risk. Pakistan's a big risk. If, we, if all those, those risks get taken care of, then we're good. And, and nobody's asking the follow-up questions. Not on the Senate side, not on the House side. Nobody's asking the follow-up questions. Like, okay, tell me exactly how this works. So, and then, and then we get it entrapped by, by host nation officials. Oftentimes we fall in love with our host nation partners uh, where they can do no wrong in our eyes. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a normal, it, it's a normal human reaction. Um, and then what we're not doing is peeking behind the curtain and seeing what's going on and, and how they're burning readiness and legitimacy faster than we can possibly build it. So um, when you look at the 2008 financial crisis, yet, I mean, virtually the same thing. Some of the world's most brilliant people running these different banks and funds. I mean, United Bank of Switzerland and... Um, Lehman Brothers and and this silo effect. Jillian, uh, author named Jillian Tetz got a wonderful book called The Silo Effect, and she traces how these how these silos, these compartments, um, prevented an understanding of broader risk, and and then the whole thing came crashing down. And you read that and you're like, hmm, this kind of helps me understand Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Thank you, sir. Can, can you explain uh, confirmation bias? Because it's a term that people may not be familiar with. 
Sure. Um, confirmation bias is the tendency to place weight on data points that affirm your pre-existing beliefs and to discount information that contradicts your pre-existing beliefs. Um, so you can look at any political debate in America right now. Climate. Cli uh, take climate change. If you believe that climate change is, is human-made primarily, uh, then every data point, every study that says the, the, the planet's getting ready to boil, I mean, you believe, and anything that says the ozone layer is being repaired at a rapid rate, you discount. And if you're on the other side of the climate debate, then you, know, you, uh, you, believe, that you believe the opposite. COVID. I mean, just look at the confirmation bias on COVID. A lot of what I read about the U.S. military, the officer corps, particularly the officers that served in Afghanistan and Iraq, have learned a lot of lessons, I guess, mostly from the military silo. Do you okay. think there's the talent there for them to spread out and learn the other lessons that need to be learned and apply that in a, in a useful way? Because many of these people are going to rise to the upper levels of the military. Um, and, you know, Austin being an exception, being allowed to serve before the seven mm -hmm. years, they may rise to other uh, uh, high levels in politics. Do you think that is where your study of this phenomena will be, I guess, implemented without actually having to ask our dysfunctional government to actually go through and do it? The military is always going to stay, I mean, brilliant people, always going to stay in its silo. And unless we start studying these things at like the war colleges, and I mean, why doesn't FSI, the Foreign Service Institute, have a body of expert knowledge on wartime negotiations? It doesn't. I mean, if you ask the military, um, frontal attack or envelopment, they'll show you the manual that says, here's how you do it. And there's, there's accountability there. You know, if, if the military is asked to get logistics from point A to point B, there's a manual for that, and there's accountability. When it comes to negotiating the end, the end of a war, how to use the elements of national power to give you leverage so your negotiations are as much in your favor as possible, there's no playbook, no body of expert knowledge, nothing anybody can point to that says, here's how this goes down. And so there's no accountability. It's all a mystery. It's all behind a curtain. Um, and, and it's undermining trust within the U.S. government. So we've got to develop this expert body of knowledge among the interagency, because in the interagency is where war is waged. Um, and perhaps it ought to be housed at places like the, the War College or taught at places like the War College, um, FSI, and, and more people ought to have to go to some of these national security institutions to learn these things. Uh, because we've got to stop using the same words to mean different things. Uh, it's an intellectual failure that you're describing. Uh, this, the, you describe the system that fails, but it's basically an intellectual failure to grasp it. And I was wondering about your own education, because at your institution at one time, and you're probably familiar with this, a little before your time, uh, Colonel Lincoln, uh, head of the Social Sciences Division, emphasized the role of the social diplomat, the military diplomat, soldier diplomat. Um, and one of the products of that, of course, was Brent Scowcroft, who indeed did understand international things. I'm curious about, because I see that as an attempt to move in the direction you're implying people should go. And I'm, I'm rather curious about whether the, the institution of which you're a product uh, still continues to think and try to act in that direction. Not much is, is how I'd respond to that. I think there's, there is a lot of respect for the soldier scholar. I mean, you look at any of the senior leaders, I know I'm using soldier scholar deliberately. Um, there's a lot of respect for that when you look at any of the senior leaders, um, and you all have mentioned some of them, I mean, deep regard for and belief in the soldier scholar. 
there is not as much talk about the warrior diplomat or the soldier diplomat. And part of it is this silo effect uh, where we, DOD doesn't want to be seen as crossing into state's turf. Um, but at the same time, state is not. I mean, when, when Obama was uh, debating, there was this long drawn out debate about the troop surge in Afghanistan in 2009. And Obama did what every other president does. He turns to the military, give me options. The military is like, all right, are they, what are they going to do? High, medium, and low. You know, that's what they're going to do. Cause, I mean, those are the military options. But nobody ever asked state to develop an option for a negotiated outcome. State never offered to develop an option for a negotiated outcome. So um, I think this is the, this is the, you know, a larger problem in, in our, our national security architecture is great for fighting World War III, but it's terrible for fighting these small wars because of these kind of, kind of silos. So I think the, the warrior diplomat, the soldier diplomat idea is, is, is a great one. Um, we need to be developing more of them on both sides of the DOD and state aisle, I think. Um, so you get better communication between the two. Right now it's DODs from Mars, states from Venus, and, and it's not working for us. Your presentation makes a very logical analysis and, and proposed approach to preventing such disasters in the future. Does anybody listen to you? That's and, why we're no, here. no, I mean, that's a serious yeah. question. Does anybody at appropriate level listen to you? The second question is, given the disaster that the final evacuation was, was there, was that inevitable or was there a cleaner approach to finally disengaging? It's hard to get new thinking into um, this very rarefied air. Uh, so that's why I like doing these. Um, I, I think that we have a, I think we've got a, an obligation to the people we send in harm's way to have our act together. I think we have a moral, we have a duty to have our act together. I think we are derelict in our duty as a country, um, as government officials, if we see that we have this pattern of dysfunction and we're doing nothing about it. I think I think it's wrong. I think it's it's I think it's morally, ethically wrong. Um, and I mean, all great people, all terribly busy dealing with all of these problems across the globe. And, and you know, that is I mean, it's very important to bear in mind. Um, at the same time, if we can do a 9-11 commission, I mean, we can do we can do a proper commission that's looking at why are we so consistently creating military interventions, the world's most powerful, most capable military that are leading to disasters um, when facing developing world militants. I mean, six of my own paratroopers, I rode a bicycle 1,700 miles to visit their graves. Um, I think we got a duty to, to them and Everybody who's served and everybody who's who's we think about putting in harm's way to get this to get this right. Um, on your uh, second question, it's hard to say really whether had we kept twenty five hundred troops there. I mean, an equally plausible scenario to it would have just kept going on going forever and would have been just fine. Is I mean. So many people had voted with their feet by that point. Um, we might have had the specter of U.S. military being chased out of Bagram, you know, C-17s flying off with the Taliban on their heels. Um, I'm not sure if that's worse than what we saw, um, but I, I don't believe that simply keeping things on autopilot was, was going to end in the near term, appreciably better. Um, and I think the very interesting question is, why is it that 
you know, because we don't think through war termination, we missed an opportunity in 2001 to expect the Taliban surrender. We missed opportunities in when I was there negotiating with them. Uh, you know, their demands were pretty, pretty light. They wanted their five guys released from Guantanamo. They wanted a political office, a couple of other things. We had our demands. And yet you would have thought the earth was going to crack if we let any of these people out of Guantanamo who spent 10 years in Guantanamo um, and let them go under house arrest in, in Doha. You would have thought the earth would crack. And yet it was a gigantic nothing burger when it happened. Um, and then when we finally, so we lose all of those opportunities. I mean, we're just forfeiting opportunity after opportunity because of this problem. And then, you know, we negotiate an agreement for no troops for promises of no terrorism. I, I, I mean, I, I can't wrap my mind around it, how we find ourselves in that situation. Chris, just, oh. just so you know, to your credit, you, you, there's, we're getting tons of questions coming in. So I'm going to try to summarize okay. a couple of them very quickly. Uh, again, good job on, on putting all this together. The, the two questions I'm going to try to combine with, with re, uh, respect to the two authors. Uh, why was corruption so difficult to stamp out? Secretar sectarianism and the inability to build legitimacy? Whose job is it to change this? So is it USAID's job? Then the second part of the set of questions is, we haven't really talked about how host nation government officials, uh, how do you keep them from caring about anything other than profiting from corruption? So the whole issue of corruption is one aspect of what you're talking yeah. about. This yeah, it's it's a great question uh, because so many perverse incentives happen as soon as you intervene militarily. And I was at the uh, in the Channel Islands a couple of years ago, and there was a Nazi base in the Channel Islands, uh, Guernsey. I think we were at. We we're in Guernsey. And when you read the reports, you know, there are British citizens that are ratting out their neighbors to the Nazis. In the American Revolution, we had the same problem of people uh, going to the British army and saying, you know, revolutionary, revolutionary, revolutionary. And they were just weren't revolutionaries. They were, you know, political, personal enemies. Um, so... So these perverse incentives are, are, are a big problem. And we have this tendency to mirror image. We think that because we serve, I mean, our government officials primarily, overwhelmingly, are serving for the common good. They don't get paid a whole lot. Um, they're pretty clean. You know, they're doing their job. I mean, they, they, they are there as genuine public servants. We tend to mirror image that to um, our counterparts. And we're walking around saying, isn't this person awesome? We're shoulder to shoulder and we're great partners when that person's robbing the people blind. And if you all are like, you know, the people, you're just looking at going, this person is either an idiot or is complicit. I, in fact, I had I had a group of Afghan elders I was meeting with, and, and they said uh, they said exactly that. You're either too dumb, you Americans are either too dumb to realize you're getting taken advantage of, or you're or you're part of the system. And that's what they believe. So are, are you saying that there was a paired life officer down there from Canada with those victims? I'm I'm saying that they didn't understand how the system worked because it's always I mean nobody's going to say hey. Major so Major Jones, I just paid two million dollars for my position. <laughs> you know, they're not going to do that. So this stuff happens behind the curtain. We had a very hard time understanding how the kleptocracy was working, and it centers on the sale of, sale of positions. Um, we we couldn't figure it out for the longest time. We finally started to figure it out in like 2010, and then had no idea what to do about it. Um, we don't have an expert body of knowledge of how to prevent these perverse incentives from taking place. And if they do take place, how to, uh, how to reverse it or uh, create incentives in the other direction. Uh, and, and in terms of whose responsibility it is, it's one of these things that falls into cracks between the silos. Nobody owns it. Nobody owns corruption. And nobody owns political legitimacy. So it falls between the silos. Nobody's dealing with it. And it's blowing everything up. 
in the early 90s, uh, after we had repaired the military after Vietnam, and about the time of the first Gulf War, uh, the wall came down. Uh, Colin Powell was the chairman. Brent Scowcroft was the national security advisor. Uh, we wrote a military strategy. And a couple of the key foundations of that was there was a common uh, refrain of, if you break it, you own it. And that was just an indication that if we invade a country and break it, it's then ours mm. to fix. And the second part of this strategy said, we're not good at fixing it. And part of the reason we're not good mm. is that we are a democracy and we're an all volunteer military. We have one year tours because we can't send people over there just to stay, which reinforces this cognitive bias that you talked about. You know, you the lessons of, of Vietnam that we were focused on then are very similar to you know what you're talking about here. Yep. The like Robbie is saying, the difficulty with me for me is that many of these really bright officers that Robbie mentioned were serving when we wrote that strategy, and somehow it just all got forgotten. Yeah, well, there there is a tendency to just wish it away. We're oh, not doing that. Vietnam, not doing that again. Afghanistan, never do that again. So this is a, I mean, this, this is a problem of institutionalized forgetting. And, and, you know, part of the rationale for the, if you break it, you own it, is to create disincentives <laughs> to intervention. Um, and, and I think we ought to be very circumspect. We ought to be before we do decide to, to intervene. Um, and then we, when we, if and when we do intervene, because sometimes we have no choice. I think, I mean, getting into Afghanistan, totally the right thing to do. Uh, but we should have, our, our best bet, knowing this pattern, is to negotiate right away. While our leverage is the highest, negotiate right away, get an outcome that meets our interests, and, um, and, then, and then move on. So, but we're not, we haven't been thinking that way. I think it's time to start um, start examining that as, as uh, one of our strategic options. So when you talk a lot about strategy with this, at, at the end of the day, I think the fight, this path through the fog here is going to be determined on the ground. And as you spoke about distinctly two different paths between the Afghan government and then the US side here and how they played with each other. With the Afghan government side, you spoke a bit about how that strategy created the perverse incentives, the shakedowns, and started translating that down to the tactical level of how that influenced things on the ground, human interaction. Can you go a little bit more as to your thoughts as to how that happened on the US side? How did the US strategy then have a play down effect to me as a lieutenant on the ground in 2012? What, how were my incentives perverted in, in your mind? I, I don't know that they were. I, I guess I don't understand the premise of your question. So if um, I think our soldiers did exactly what we told them to do, and they did it by and large to a very high standard. I, I understand that. But if we went along this way and you're saying that the strategy is flawed here. Right. I'm not saying myself or my soldiers did anything wrong that we weren't mm -hmm. asked to do, but maybe we were asked to do the wrong things. That's very possible. So um, when the emphasis is on all the incentives are killing and capturing rather than um, building relationships and stabilizing areas, then we're creating incentives for people to do things that may be creating more civilian casualties, thus pushing more people into the arms of the insurgency. So a lot of what we incentivize our units to do um, are creating behaviors that are prop that are counterproductive. That's happened. Um, you know, at the same time, you have the situation where you can win every battle but lose the war. 
And, and that's part of what we saw also in Vietnam, Afghanistan. Um, there, there's this great quote, and I know you're thinking I'm gonna talk about the quote of, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the quote about uh, Harry Summers. Uh, so that's one quote where Harry Summers says, we won every battle and yes, but you know, that was also irrelevant, uh, the Vietnamese reply. A, a South Vietnamese official uh, told a, a reporter that uh, the problem with you Americans is that you want it more than we do. Uh, my question yes, to you <laughs> um, is this. You talked about um, them not really having a strategy to come out and to leave the Afghans um, responsible for their own government, so to speak. My question is, how much of this falls on the contractor, military contractors, who engage in really promoting war for their long-term mm. benefit. And because it's almost like this, if, if I gave a contractor a limited amount of time to do his or her job, you'll find it more efficient in giving them a limited amount of time because the contractor doesn't care how long it goes mm. because it benefits him. And then my final question, who was the main contractor in general, for um, Afghanistan, I think you just mentioned it, Halliburton. So the, the question goes back to these contractors and who palm, I guess they are, rubbing to keep this cycle going on. I wouldn't want a strategy to come out either if I'm getting paid. That's just common sense. Could it's, you speak it, on that? It's, it's, you know, it's worth looking at, I think. Um, those kind of perverse incentives. Now the contractors aren't making national security decisions, of course. Uh, you know, not they're not in the situation room, so to speak. Um, but you do have, I mean, you do have those perverse incentives. You do have the revolving door between the senior ranks of the armed services and the boards of big defense contractors. Uh, one of my colleagues once once wrote, uh, and you'll Rob, you'll get this, um, that if a private loses a weapon is is held um, more accountable than a general who loses a war. A private who loses a weapon is going to get an honorable, other than honorable discharge. A general who loses a war, going to be on a board of a big contractor maybe. Um, and, and then you've got the, you've got incentives for, you know, things like think tanks who, Threat inflation is a big incentive for think tanks. And, and so, I, you know, I, I think in all of these, you have to always consider the source of where you're getting where you're getting information um, and look at what's you know, what's in it for them. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist and, and um, you know, but I believe that there are incentives that shape behavior. And I think we have to be very careful about those. So thank you very much again. Thank you.